one, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. On today's show, retirement planning for executives and business owners, part two in our series on financial security through tax advantage strategies with nationally recognized retirement authority, Charlie Day. Welcome to the second segment, Charlie. Thank you, Steve. Great to be here. Charlie, I'm bowing to your actuarial prowess. I mean, you know, we're talking about, there's some numbers to be calculated here, isn't it? I mean, you have serious science behind this. (laughs) Yeah. And the law is on our side. Right. I just want to repeat, uh, if, you have, if you're just walking in, uh, Charlie's a member of the American Academy of Actuaries. He's also an enrolled actuary. He has so many of these. He's also CLU, conventional uh, credits. Mm-hmm. He has uh, so many things to talk about throughout this week. And one of the big things we're trying to talk about is these extra ancillary benefits in a defined benefit plan that go above and beyond just income. Right. And really, there's some real serious science to this, and my best part, tax deductions. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about it, because let's walk through this slide and just give me the basics of what we're looking at. Well, we talked last time about the difference between a lump sum-based plan, where the participant has a right, and a benefit-based plan, where it's solely focused on benefits. Mm-hmm. And as a result, the financing caps are taken off because of the definition of a no lump sum provision. So to compare and contrast, the code tells me how much I can provide a deduction for, say, the maximum benefit under the law, which is $215,000 of annual lifetime income for somebody between 62 and 65. So if I'm 52 years old, with this, this graph is, is describing, the code and every actuary should come up with this number, about $204,000. Now, if they have an insurance advisor and they want to add a death benefit, we, the actuaries, calculate the actuarial cost of that death benefit. And we can add to that and take it up to 259000 which is about $51,000 more uh, total contribution. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's the actuarial value. So in, in a small plan like that, you have to buy an insurance policy to transfer the risk. In a large plan, we can self-insure. Mm-hmm. But that is the maximum deduction for somebody who's age 52. Now, if we remove the lump sum provision, then we can fund to the most valuable benefit under the code, which is a 100% joint and survivor. That means a pension that continues for the lifetime of the participant and the spouse, regardless of who dies first. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's fundamental financial security, Steve. Mm -hmm. Okay. That raises the deduction from 204 to 265,000. So the result of that benefit, more valuable benefit, will raise that cost by Mm $61,000. Now, In addition, I can provide a death benefit. I could add a pre-retirement death benefit and add another $55,000 to this cost. Or I could provide both a pre-retirement and post-retirement, a death benefit that continues Mm -hmm. after retirement. That raises our actuarial value because we've added another benefit Mm -hmm that's going to begin when, bo- when the participant has died. That raises the deduction to 539000 mm-hmm. Now, generally, a policy needs to be bought by the participant's plan sponsor, and it should be paid up at retirement because you can't mm-hmm. pay premiums after retirement. And that policy is designed to, insurance policy, is designed to provide and guarantee this death benefit. Mm-hmm. Generally, that premium of limited pay life insurance policy is about one third of this cost increase. The the balance is going into hard investment assets Mm -hmm. that will help inure the plan's financial Mm -hmm. strength. So you can see how you choose the nature of your plan, whether you have a lump sum right or you don't, changes the magnitude of the potential mm. benefits that you can have. 
Well, now, when I think about this, you're talking about a cut. You, know, you went from 204 to 539,000. Right. So this is not a small adjustment. This is a major course adjustment. And we're talking, we talk about contribution. We're talking about tax deduction at that level. Yes. Oh, my gosh. And that's annual. Yes. Okay. All right. Here we see the problem of the lump sum focus plan. We talked about GATT in our first section. And that was in 1994, Congress wrote into the GATT Treaty a statutory limitation on how much a lump sum based, a plan where the participant has a right to the assets, can have. And so if you're successful in investing and you exceed this cap of $2.5 million, you're going to be subject to a 50% excise tax. On everything above the line. Yeah, right. So that's called overfunded. So your actuary is going to tell you to terminate the plan before you get into that situation. But there's even a bigger problem with this type of plan. You can see that at 5%, if I'm pulling out the maximum benefit that I can have under the code, $17,900 a month or $215,000 a year, I'm going to run out of money in by age 80. Well before life expectancy. Right. And if, and so if I want to keep the amount of money constant, Steve, do you know what you would have to earn? Well, let's go to the next slide and you'll see. You'd have to earn nine and a quarter percent. In other words, to get this benefit, keep the asset intact and make sure that you don't run out of money. You have to earn nine mm -hmm. and a quarter percent. I don't know about you, but I would find it very difficult to be able to consistently earn nine and a quarter percent for the next 30 some odd years. And that'd years. be nine and a quarter net of all expenses of the mutual fund or ETF or whatever Got it, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's no way that's going to happen. Most people are conservative thinkers like we are on this show. I agree with you. That number's out of line. So let's look at the profound value that a benefit focused defined benefit can provide. That'll take us to the next slide. There, Steve, you see, we're way above. We've increased the magnitude of the assets by, by over 30%, three, almost $3.6 million. And that amount of money will provide that $215,000 or seventeen nine dollars a month for the lifetime of two people well into their 90s. Mm -hmm. Now... What if your investment advisor can earn, say, something like 6%? Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at the next slide. If I can earn 6 and a quarter percent, you see, the asset remains level. The benefit stream continues for as long. And the actuarial gain then would be created at the death of both the participant and the spouse, and guess what we can do with that? In the next segment, Steve, we could find out what the values are of that gain. It's profound. Mm -hmm. So, in order to make these plans work, there are three fundamental entities that must come into play. The first is the entity itself. It has to have business purpose if you're sponsoring a plan. Compensation, there must be earned income. You can't use passive income unless it's part of the enterprise itself. And it must be reasonable. Those are three criteria in order to actually have a plan that can be on firm ground for operation. The next aspect is the plan itself. And in our plan, if you'll go to the next slide, we use two trustees in our plan. One is the plan sponsor, usually. We call it the participant trustee. And the other is a trustee who handles the death benefit aspect of the plan. For financial planners, this is very much akin to an irrevocable life insurance trust, where you have a a uh, independent trustee that has control mm -hmm. over all the assets 
that relate to insurance, mm -hmm. death benefits. And the object is, is to wall off incidents of ownership of the death benefit. Remember, in a benefit-based plan, Steve, you, the participant, don't own the underlying assets, so the assets aren't included in your estate. The insurance can, death benefit from the plan can be potentially included in the estate unless you've been able to wall off incidents mm -hmm. of ownership. And we do that through the use of the two trustees mechanism. Mm -hmm. And that, that separation is what gives us the validation that it will not appear in the estate assets. Right. Okay. Now, under the Retirement Equity Act of 1984, a death benefit from a plan must go to the spouse. It's a law that protected spouses because, um, and especially in union plans, participant dies, death benefit, there's no death benefit, the spouse out of luck. Mm -hmm. So the Retirement Equity Act changed those rules and said the spouse must have the right to receive it. But the Internal Revenue Commissioner said that a spouse can disclaim it, disclaim mm. the right to receive the death benefit. Mm. And in doing so, that the lawyers say that's not a gift of either present or future interest. It's not included in her estate. Participant's dead. Mm. It's not even involved. He has no mm. ownership rights. Spouse has a right to receive the benefit, but can disclaim it, and that disclaimer doesn't constitute ownership. Now we have a death benefit that could go to the participant's trust. Which so, are probably their kids' beneficiaries, more than likely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're able to take these planned death benefits and move them to the next generation. And we'll talk later about how we're able to move the plan assets. Well, don't forget to watch our next segment on estate planning for executives and business owners, part three in our series on financial security through tax advantage strategies. And keep in mind, before moving forward with any of the ideas on our show, always check with your tax consultant, legal counsel, or your financial advisor. You've been watching Steve Savant's Money. Oh my God.